yeah, it's been over 12 months. So we'll just, I'd give it a minute or two for everyone to sort of get in and say good day and a bit stuck in. So um, yeah, I'll give it one minute before it started. So if there's anyone there, say good day in the chat before we get started. So, cool. So yes, yeah, so if anyone that doesn't know uh, what's been going on and the reason I've been so quiet and nothing's really been happening <laughs> is, um, yeah, over 12 months ago, just 28th of February, 2022, we had two meters of water through a flood-free business. So we we're in Lismore, we're meant to be in a flood-free area. So um, yeah, it was a bit of a challenge uh, when that, that comes through. We had two meters of water through the shop. So we've been rebuilding, it's been a real challenge. Um, with lots of questions and lots of people supporting us and things like that. And you know, still to this day, we haven't received any insurance money, which has um, been a bit of a downer um, because yeah, we, we were in a flood free area. Uh, we didn't have insurance for flood. So it's been one of those challenges been w w working through over the past 12 months and getting things going. And so, yeah, so, and one of the reasons I started to want to really do this live stream and um, you know, I might as well get stuck in if any questions of, you can pop in there, get some comments already. Um, I'm gonna hi, hi, Trisha. Um, yeah, one of the biggest reasons I want to do this live stream and to ask questions and get out there is, you know, over the last 12 months in this video here, I've asked, you know, I've been asked over 150 times questions regarding AC coupling uh, in an off-grid situation. And in this today, I wanna to go through and wanna run through just to answer everyone's questions and save me replying to everything on YouTube and lots of stuff to really help out that I can answer everyone's questions in one video uh, because it's very time consuming for me to go through go through and ask everyone, answer everyone's questions. And something for me is really important. I wanna make sure that everyone that asks a question that we can help you with advice that can help you solve whatever situation that you wanna do. So, so yeah, so this has been for us the last 12 months, probably actually one of the last videos I posted. Um, before the floods hit, and this is our old shop. It was interesting after the floods, I come back in and this had actually caught on fire. And we actually, on that wall there, I can't see that one, um, we had a load of solar inverters on there. And basically I think we had one, we had a solar edge EV charger, we had an ABB, that one there. We had a solar edge three-phase commercial system and we had a Huawei three-phase commercial system. And um, all of them caught on fire, except for the solar edge EV charger um and the victron so <laughs> the, the when we go to the shop um we actually used to use these victron to charge the batteries in the forklift so overnight what we'd actually do is we charge the batteries in the forklift all day plug it in and when i got into the shop if you look at the other video you'll see um i commented that the the victron was still flashing and the lights were still on and um it was still cranking <laughs> so low voltage dc hey uh where all the other inverters that caught on fire uh, i think it was because basically we didn't turn anything off we, we didn't think we we're going underwater and yeah if, if so i'm 183 centimeters tall and um we had 1.92 meters of water in in the shop so about 511 for you american guys over there um we had through there so um cool but i'm getting stuck into it i want to show you and hopefully i can answer as many questions as i can in um in this here about ac coupling and why I think it's actually really important. Um, yeah, why I think it's really important, really beneficial. And as you, if you're designing your system or you're a customer, you want to add this to it, why it's really beneficial. So I need to explain the difference between AC coupling and DC coupling first. So we'll start with DC coupling. So what DC coupling is, is with solar panels, it's DC standing for direct current. That means all the power that comes from your solar panels comes down. And normally we put those through an MPPT, which is a maximum power point tracker. Where if you think about it, it's an automatic gearbox for your solar panels. So just make sure that your solar panels are in the right gear and get the maximum out of them. Now, back in the days, I really think very rarely people will ever use PWMs these days, which is a pulse width modulator. And all they were designed to do that when batteries got full, they would literally turn the solar panels off. And it's one of those things when you're designing solar panels, you could only have the panels a certain voltage higher than the battery voltages so there's a lot of string fusing lots of cables running from the roof and junction boxes and a lot of work so with these days the mppts uh, victron have just released a new rs450 slash 100 200 a lot of high voltage stuff victron are doing uh you know you can put 10 panels in a string 
one run set of panels down, it's more efficient, less losses and things like that. But just to, yeah, so DC coupling is pretty much direct current from panels straight down through a charge controller and straight to batteries that charges your batteries. It's pretty simple. Um, now, AC coupling, let me figure out this next one here. So what AC coupling is, so we're actually taking a grid connected inverter. So a grid connected, I know a lot of people think, oh, it's a bit contradicted, Mikey, that's off grid, we're using a grid connected inverter. I know just use that term because it's easier for people to understand. The proper terminology that is, you know, we would normally use, I actually haven't been sharing my screen. Um, I actually just pop back and I'll show you this one here. Um, yeah, so apologies for that, guys. So next time someone let me know, I'm not sharing my screen. <laughs> so yeah, so this is the DC coupling system. We can pop in here, solar panels, MPPT, straight to batteries. Now we'll jump over here to the AC coupling. Now with the AC coupling, yeah, we're using a grid connected inverter and AC coupling inverter. So AC is alternating current, and that's what you get out of your wall. So for you guys in the States, it's 110 volts. Uh, I know there's a lot more people in the States using 240 these days. Uh, or dual phase systems and doing some really cool stuff over there. And now in Australia, everything's 240 in Germany and in the UK. And, you know, I know there's a lot of people from South Africa that follow us. Um, so with the AC coupled inverter, we're taking a grid connected inverter or an AC coupled inverter, which is this one up here. So the one up top, the gray with the little red dot on the front of it. And so it needs the grid to survive. So literally without any grid, it won't work. So in an off grid situation, what happens is the Victron, it keeps that alive. So the Victron is the grid in this situation where it provides 240 volt to the, the grid connected inverter. Now, a lot of people say, oh, Mike, you know, we get this question all the time is why don't inverters work when there's no batteries involved? Now, it's purely a design point of view. These grid connected inverters for safety um, is that when the grid fails, that all these inverters don't stay on and push all that power back to the grid when lines are trying to work on it. So it's just a purely design and safety feature. It's the easiest way to control and turn everyone's systems off when there's a blackout um, and make it safe for the lines when they go do any repairs and things like that. So we will touch on as well using this in a grid and off-grid situation. I will talk about it towards the end, but at the moment we're really focusing on here using these AC coupled off-grid because that's we've had 150 questions asking about this uh, yeah, in the last couple of months. So. That's how it works there. So we've got the Victron, it provides power to this grid connected inverter and it's gonna keep it alive in this situation. Now we'll jump over here. So I'll show you, we've actually designed quite a few systems like this uh, and this is more of a grid. So if you're off grid, just forget this grid part. But I'll just, I'll talk you through an example is probably the easiest way to think about it and what a lot of people do. So here in Australia, what tends to happen, people have like an old, maybe it's a, you know, six or seven year old system, they've got a grid connected inverter and they've got two or three kilowatts of panels on it. Things still good, still probably another 10 or 15 years in it. And it's just not worth ripping it off. And they've got enough space to put another system up, but they want to put batteries and we want to do an AC coupled inverter. So what we can do in that situation, because a lot of the old inverters, the way the Victron controls this, um, the inverters is by frequency shifting. So we'll get into that in a bit, but that's how we, controller is with frequency shifting. So a lot of the old inverters we can't control, they weren't set up for like that and they're old. So what we do, we just leave them on the grid side. So we think about it like that. So what happens with these old inverters when the grid fails, that inverter's on the grid side, it drops off, it doesn't work, no power, nothing it can do. Where in an off-grid side, what happens in that blackout situation, if the sun's out, the Victron will momentarily but you open the contactor, disconnect the grid. It'll wait a few seconds to let everything settle down, make sure there's no energy coming from the grid, everything's safe on that side. And then it'll make sure that it can keep this thing alive. So with the grid connected inverters, they will drop out momentarily when that happens because there's a frequency change. So there's a Victron changes. So we'll hang on, shift the frequency. We've lost the grid. We're in control now. So let's hang on, which will turn the PV inverter, the grid connected one off. So that's what happens there. And then what will happen about 20 seconds later, depending on, and I'll show you the reason we use a certain inverter, um, 20 seconds to a minute later, most of the grid connected inverters in Australia, um, by law and standards is at 60 seconds, they need to wait, have a think about it before they're allowed to start up and start ramping up. So, and in this situation here in this system, we've got the AC couple, 
So that'll take the 60 seconds to ramp up. For the whole time, you've got your DC coupled panel. So in this situation, and I highly recommend it, if you are designing to use your DC coupled panels along with your AC coupled panels. Because the whole time this one's turned off, these panels here, he'll still charge the batteries. If your batteries were full, this would be providing energy through to your inverter and through to your load. So we're sending it to the inverter. The inverter would be turning that DC into AC and powering your house until this inverter started firing up. Now, some really good things about that there is that, you know, for redundancy, if you only get DC coupled panels and you have your MPPT fail, if you've got an AC coupled inverter in there, you've got that backup. So you've got two systems and, you know, years ago, this wasn't a thing. We'd always design with MPPTs. That's pretty much what everyone did. Then we started learning how to use AC coupled inverters and systems. And we started, you know, when I first started doing it, I've used like four panels to an MPPT and then put most of everything to the AC coupled inverter. Um, the more you use in your AC coupled inverter, the less wiring for the installer or whoever's doing the job on the roof. It just does actually make the lower install. Uh, yeah, it, it makes it easy to install but you are dealing with higher voltages to so something you're aware of. Um, certain countries, you can't play around with high voltages and do stuff. I know in the States, you can do whatever you want. Uh, in Australia, for some reason, the electricity is a bit more dangerous in Australia, um, or they think we're not as smart as the Americans, so we're not allowed to touch it in Australia over a certain voltage. So something to think about. Um, so, yeah, so the other benefits of, yeah, and one other thing I've started doing when I was designing systems for customers uh, and involved in doing the designs, I actually started putting, trying to spin up about 50-50. So, because what I found with only four panels to MPPTs, what would happen, and the reason this is really good, is if the batteries are run flat. Now, if the batteries are run flat, you've only got, so we go back to this design here, you've only got this system here and you don't have the grid or you don't have a generator, there's no way for your system to fire back up and start back up because we need the grid. So if the Victron's gone flat, we need the grid, it's got no grid because it's shut down. It's gone into a blackout situation. And then we've got the PV inverter that it can't start up because the Victron's got no charge. But, so you're in a bit of a conundrum there where you can't actually charge your batteries again because your PV inverter can't work and your generator's not there and you don't have the grid. So if you've got an auto start generator, that would ideally start, charge the batteries and not let get that situation. Or if you've got the grid, it would keep it alive until everything goes back in. Now, what I found is when customers, you know, it's one of those things as well, customers just really don't like using generators. Um, you know, for me, it's one of those things. I like to run my generator more often than not because anything that's got fuel or diesel in it, you don't want it to go stale and it's a mechanical. Cars that sit around and don't get used tend to wear out faster than the ones that get used all the time or use regularly rather than sit around doing nothing. So what we started doing, because we found that what would happen when batteries would go flat, we've only got four solar panels to this, it actually take too long, you know, and when I say too long, like an hour or two to get enough charge in the batteries to turn these inverters back on so it can actually crank the PV. So we started designing a bit more and Victron have also offered bigger, better MPPTs these days so we can put more panels. You know, rather than three or six panels on a small MPPT, uh, we can now put 10 or 12 panels into it. <clears throat> One of the new high voltage 450 slash 100 MPPTs. They are a bit more expensive upfront purchase, you will save that money though in in um in installation costs and stuff on the roof. That makes sense. So the more panels you get to your MPPT, the faster it's going to charge your batteries if you do get to a blackout situation. Uh, but the reality is off grid. You really want that backup. Just start your journey, get your batteries up to the startup voltage for your inverter again, and get it to kick on again. So it's just pretty cool. Um, so that's what we started doing there with a lot of systems like that there um, to make sure that. That reliability there. So DC panels and AC panels are really, really important. And in this situation here, so you understand, so this is more for grid connected customers only. We put an energy meter in. Now actually we'll show you, uh, yeah, we put an energy meter in. And I'll show you my house in a minute. So what happens is this here is actually on the grid side. The Victron actually technically doesn't see that. But what happens is when the Victron sees this old PV inverter for a grid connected customer, it sees the energy going back to the grid. The energy meter says, hang on. We've got energy going back to the grid there. Let's turn the charger on in the Victron and send it to batteries. So that's how the Victron will operate in that grid connected inverter system where they actually don't have it. 
Uh, a lot of these new Victron, you actually don't need an energy meter. You can just use a CT, um, which just literally clamps around your mains. Um, there's a distance and stuff involved in that. So it is quite simple to do that um, from an installation point of view, where you get your access to your old inverter. So you don't have to rip that off and throw it in the bin. It's not useless. Um, you've got your other PV inverter on your load output. So when the grid fails, you've got that cranking. And then you've also got your other panels direct the batteries. Now, if the grid was available, the only reason I'd say never put an MPPT in is if the grid was available or you had an auto start generator, because most of the time you find, and look, what I've learned, I've been doing this for 14 years. What I've learned, there is always a situation you get put in where you just don't have power, <laughs> always. So um, there's moments, you know, I've had people that have everything and there's had no fuel in the diesel in the generator. And yeah, there's always a situation. So just be prepared for that from time to time, you know? We're humans, we make mistakes and we forget things from time to time. So um, it is what it is. Don't beat yourself up. Now I'm gonna move on. So I'm gonna show you a couple of examples of a couple of systems. Now, um, this one here is an off-grid system. As you can see here, it has a PV inverter. Now, if you are off-grid and you do have one of these systems, um, I'll find what I can show you later on. Um, but this is the AC load to this customer. You see the PV inverter is doing 1500 watts. And the battery charger is doing the PV charger, so just a couple of panels. I think this system is about six panels, which go direct to batteries. You'll see everything that operates here like that, where it's cranking uh, and going to batteries. As you can see here, technically this AC has come here, it'll feed the loads. And then when it's finished with those loads, it'll come back over here and the Victron will take it and put it back down to batteries. Where this one here, just follow the dots, it's gonna put direct to batteries and charge your batteries. And uh, later on this afternoon, what you'll see in these systems is that one of these normally gets turned off. Some systems will keep both on. It just really depends on your energy load, how much you use. Uh, normally what happens, one of these two get torn off. Turn off. Normally it's the PV charger. will normally get tripped off uh, from the Victron. It'll control it. And what it'll do, it'll actually send through um, all the power to run the AC loads and any excess will come over to batteries. And that's what normally happens later on. And it does a frequency shift, which I'll get into that in a minute. Um, Cool, this is my place, here we go. So the off-grid shop. So um, yeah, so I'm on the grid. I use my Victron here as my backup system and I have no PV in a blackout situation. So I don't have anything over here. I will do, I will have an MPPT. It's sitting in the shed on the bench uh, with the panel sitting at the back on the wall and it's been like that for, yeah, good 18 months, I reckon. <laughs> so um, it just is what it is. So as you can see here in my system, I've got my PV inverter here. It's coming in and charging the batteries and the current inverter I'm testing at the moment has only got a 3,300 watt charger. So we're charging the batteries flat out as much as it can, giving the excess to the loads and then feeding everything excess to that to grid. What, what it can't use is putting out to the grid there. So um, it actually looks like the math is not correct there. It looks like one of my inverters actually dropped off the internet. Um, so I actually have two inverters. And if you look at those calculations there, um, that's 3,000, so really let's churn all that up. AC loads and stuff's going back to the grid. So yeah, so, so one of my inverters has dropped off the internet because it's probably really, we'll jump over here, we actually jump over the solar edge. One up, still saying three, so I we'll have to double check that. We'll get some calculations not doing so well over there. Let's jump up to five. Um, oh no, sorry, it's three, so to double check that one. Uh, I think one of my PV inverters, it's dropped off the internet because yeah, those, those numbers there are not working out. There's, too much energy being used and charged for the amount of PV going on. So I bet one of my inter inverters would jump off the internet. And that's the, I suppose, the downside with wiring things with Wi-Fi uh, is when that happens, the new data just doesn't look right. So um, that's my place there. We'll jump into another off-grid place. And here we go. Now, um, this is another off-grid place with a PV inverter. And this is a perfect one to show. Okay, great. As you can see, it's got zero AC loads in an off-grid situation. And what that means is they've actually got two inverters out there and one of theirs has actually dropped off Wi-Fi. So they've got one inverter running the AC loads and then you can only see the information from this one. And that's white zero. So if you do have a system like this and you're not seeing your AC loads, because a lot of people say, Mike, I've installed this PV inverter and therefore my energy loads have disappeared. I know I'm using energy. It's just that the system can't see it. That's all it is. So it can't see the, the PV. Um, 
So guys, I'll give you questions in two secs. Um, so yeah, so that's why the AC loads go to zero because the Victron just can't see that AC load basically because it's dropped off the internet. And we used to use um, energy meters all the time to read the PVs. Wi-Fi got a lot better. I don't know this system here. We actually have an issue with it when they shut the garage door that the system drops off the internet. So uh, they're actually getting everything hardwired and things like that. So which would be really good once they get this hardwired. We won't have these days where the thing drops off because the garage door is shut uh, on this property. So um, yeah, so that, that, that's that one there. Let's jump over to here. Okay, so some tri trips, some tips and tricks about AC coupling. So this is something that you want to do. It's a one-to-one -one rule. So if you've got a 5 kVA Victron, um, over here, 5 kVA Victron, you can only have a 5 kVA PV inverter. If that makes sense. So you can't put bigger. I have actually done bigger in before. And if you think about what I've done before, because there has been situations where the one I've actually done it with, we had an 8 kVA Victron, and we wanted to put 11 kVA of uh, FEMA AC coupled inverters on. And what I did to trick the system is so I actually put the energy meter in. So what happened? We had the PV inverters. So there's PV inverters. And then we had the loads. And then on this other side here, I put an energy meter. So when the system would crank up and feed the loads, I would then tell the energy meter we're not allowed to send more than eight kilowatts back to the multi plus. Now we are running a risk if something goes wrong, we could break the multi plus. But that's what we would do the quattro on that situation. Uh, we could break something. Uh, we are running a risk, but we gave it a go. Customers willing to test it out and that run that risk. And yeah, so so far it, it's worked great. And so the system just PV inverter works, it feeds all the AC loads. And so that allows the inverter to ramp up really, really high to its maximum if the AC loads need it. And then it goes through all the loads and goes to the 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 invert the grid connector. Normally it's an export meter. And then it thinks that it's actually exporting back to the Victron and it's not allowed to put more, more than eight kilowatts. So as soon as it comes through here, it comes to loads and then gets the export meter. It ramps down and says, okay, we're not allowed to send more than eight kilowatts past that. If you really want to be safe, you might pull it down to seven or six or whatever um, to make sure. And the reality is in most of the Victrons is if you were doing that, your battery charger wouldn't be able to handle the excess current anyway and charge the batteries flat out. So, you know, you might only need to, you might be able to reduce it down to four kilowatts to the Victron and once it's gone through the load. So that's just something, a little, little trick that I've done over the years. So. Um, cool. So what I'll do, guys, before I hand on to the next few sections, I'll actually answer some questions. So what have we got here? Um, cool. Mr. Snowman, question from the UK. In a system with a small amount of solar panels, what is the smallest grid tied inverter that a MultiPlus can use? Uh, look, I think the smallest, it's going to come down to the, the, the PV inverter. It's not about the MultiPlus. The MultiPlus, it's actually the maximum, which I just talked about then. So a lot of grid connect inverters or the PV inverters will have like a hundred volt minimum startup. So you're going to want, you know, so say for example, panels are 40 volts each. I would recommend maybe put at least 160 volts in because you will get that situation on a daytime where it's crappy. Your panels are only doing 80 volts and your grid connected inverter won't fire up if that makes sense. So that's something to really think about there and be aware of. Um, if you're going to go minimum in the smallest amounts, it's more about the maximum. You can't go over that. Or if you want to, like I said, I just did with the energy meter, I export it. So the grid connect inverter thinks it's feeding back to the grid and it won't feed any more than what we've told it back to the quattro. Um, so you can do cheeky things like that. So uh, Mr. Stone has another question. Um, yep, I think that was the same question. Um, yep, cool, we've answered that. Awesome. Um, Cool, I think we've answered everything else in there between now and then. Done, yep, I think I've talked about everything else, all the other questions that have been asked. Okay, so some other things I wanna talk about that, um, and we'll get into this frequency. So what I'll do, I'll come back here and I'll show you on this system here. So what happens is the Victron controls things by frequency. And frequency shifting is something that's been used for a very long time around the world. Um, anyone that's got um, off-peak hot water, that's how the networks do it. They're really consistent, the big generators that power our, our, our networks. So what they do is to turn the hot, hot, water, hot water on, they change the frequency 
and they might send a really high frequency through the network. And that tells all the hot water relays to open up and it's basically a dump load. So when the network's a lot of energy, they, they frequency shift and they send out those energy. So here in the Victron, we can see it's 50 hertz. Uh, if you're in the States, it's gonna be 60 something. And depending what country, and most Germany, UK, I think the UK is actually 240, 60 volts, 60 hertz. I'm not quite sure. If anyone from the UK knows that, um, whack it in there so and let us know. Um, but your your frequency will be different all around the world and, and what happens and how it changes things. So in this situation, what the Victron does is when the batteries get to, the, the way they work in Australia uh, or in the Victrons basically, they normally have three frequency shift changes. So they'll get to about halfway when the batteries are, you know, getting almost full, they'll say to the, they'll change the frequency and say, hey, hang on, we don't want all that PV power throttle back and we only want half of it. So if you get a six kilowatt inverter, a PV inverter, the Victron might say to it, hey, we're just gonna shift that, we're gonna slow it right up. We only want half the energy. So it'll turn, the PV inverter will go, okay, great, I'm only gonna give you half my capacity. Now, that's really good. And I'll just explain this electronics. So in Australia, or anywhere in the world, electronics is probably, you know, well, it's not probably, it is the best money, best inverter you can buy in the market for um yeah it's the best money you can buy it's the best quality inverter that you can get anywhere in the world basically hands down it's made here in australia it's unbelievable um does it mean it's better than victron not really uh, in my opinion victron has a lot more smarts and things like that but if you wanted like the best most reliable you know 99.9 percent .9 failure rate uh, non-failure rate you know you'd be going with the electronics the problem with electronics and frequency is they don't do it real well um, and they don't like it. So the, the way electronics do it is with their PV inverters. And I'll explain to the reason that we use the ABB or FEMA over the Fronuses later on towards the end of it and why there's such a better inverter. Now, the way electronics do it is, you know, technically you have to send your inverter to them. They put a card in there with a cable and they the electronics themselves control all through communications, they control the PV inverters. With a with a Victron, you can sort of grab any old, um, you know, SMA is a really good old reliable inverter that I see a lot of people use secondhand. Um, there's most inverters and most newer inverters these days on the market you can use. Most inverters will have a frequency shift change, so you're not limited to you have to use the FEMA or the Fronius. And look. They are, well, the FEMA, in my opinion, is like one of the best inverters in the world from a grid connected point of view. You don't have to use one of those. Um, like if you're looking to save money and do this, there's a load of SMAs are out in the marketplace. They have a microgrid setting. We can just click that for your country and it'll change the settings to match the Victron and you're pretty much done. Connect it to your Wi-Fi and the Victron will be able to see all that sort of stuff. So if you jump on the Victron forums, there's a lot of information on there and I'll put some links down below to be able to access that information. Um, okay, cool. So we've got that there, the PV inverters. Now, yeah, that's the reason. The reason we use the FEMA is I actually sort of jump into this now. So in an off-grid situation, I, I did the calculations a few years ago, and everyone, you see most grid-connected guys you talk to, talk to, they're about, oh, Fronius is like 98% efficient and this and that, and blah, blah, blah. It's all about efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. Now, look, the reality is I've done the numbers once between a, 98% efficient inverter and a 97% efficient inverter. In over a 10 year period, so the warranty period, which is, you know, I'll use Fronius as an example compared to the FEMA. Fronius is a five plus a five year warranty. So you've got to register stuff, do things to get your warranty. And then, you know, it's only parts for five years and labor for five years, and the next five years is different and blah, blah, blah. But the FEMAs, they're a 10 year out of the box, you know, no, have to fill forms out or lodge stuff or do something different or pay for something. It's just bang, you got a 10 year warranty. Simple, it's done. But the real reason we use them off grid from an efficiency point of view, honestly, couldn't tell you the difference in the efficiencies. And if you really want to know this, talk to the guys at Selectronics, so the Australian company, and ask them. If you ask the engineers down there and ask which is the better inverter, all the engineers will say the FEMA um, inverter. Because they're a lot more programmable in an off-grid situation. But the one thing that's really important off-grid in this situation is they're faster. So think about it like this. When we turn a kettle on in an off-grid situation, when we do an AC coupling, what happens we turn that kettle on? 
And when we turn the kettle on, the fronties might be like, oh, oh I'm hanging out, I'm sh shifted. And then Victron says, oi, come on, mate, let's go. We need some power. The fronties be like, yeah, mate, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming, I will get there. 20 seconds later, the Fronius says, hey, all right, you know, I'm being a big stream here. But the Fronius will fire up, help you give a load. And so what happens with the Victron, if we just pop back over here in that situation, we'll just look at my place. This is a good example. So what would happen in this situation is the batteries would provide the load and help support this load until the PV inverter fired up. Maybe look at these guys' places. So if that makes sense. So why it's waiting for the Fronius to wake up and get over its yawn and brush its teeth and do its thing. You flick the kettle on, you're hammering your batteries, you're pulling everything from batteries and the Fronius finally gets around and says, okay, a few minutes later, supports the load. Once it starts supporting the load, the battery's like, oh, okay, we can go back to rest. Now it's daytime, we don't need to work of the day, you know? That's the whole point with the battery. So um, with the femurs, we've actually got a program We've done a lot of research. We've played a lot of this over the years and we actually have them that instantly, they, um, it's within two seconds, basically. Within two seconds, the femur's like, right, let's go, come on, let me deal that load. I want the batteries working of a day. The femur's like, me, 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 me. I'm gonna get that load and I'm gonna power it. So it's really different to just from a, a cycle point of view and like looking after your batteries and protecting your batteries with these femurs, they tend to happen a lot faster. I'm being a bit dramatic in a big stream here just to get the point across, but that is the reality. You will cycle your batteries less by using a femur because they're so much faster. And there's not an inverter in the world on the marketplace that has the program programmability uh, or that's as fast as the um, the femur. So and if you really want to understand the data, talk to the guys at Selectronics. That's where I got my information from, the engineers down there. And they prefer using the femurs any day of the week. They said it's like chalk and cheese. Um, but uh, Fronius has a fanboy around the world and everyone loves the Fronius. So something to think about around there. Uh, with the femurs so and just to touch on that you know abb they're an italian company femurs an italian company abb sold their inverter fema brought it but fema sorry abb actually purchased an aurora brand which had a load of failures a load of warranties and issues and unfortunately for poor old abb they brought it at the time when everything just failed and abb had to honor all that fix all the warranties and deal with it all and it's just complicated you know you imagine just Imagine buying a new business and then you brought all these products and they just all failed on you, you know? So would have been not, not a nice thing to experience as a, as a supplier. And ABB had to fix all that. They did. They honoured it. They did take a bit of time to get it fixed and sorted because they just brought a new business and everything just failed. Uh, so they lost a lot of confidence in installs because of the time they took to deal with that and customers weren't happy and waiting and that sort of stuff. So um, it's just one of those things. But yeah, from my opinion, from FEMA, ABB, since we've been dealing with them, uh, we've been really installing these things for about six years and um, I've had less than five, you know, yeah, I wouldn't even, I think four failures we've had and I actually think two of them been really recently and I think it was an installer issue that um, that actually installed them. Uh, it actually happened within the first few days of the installation, which makes me think that there was an installer that basically um, that did it all, that installed it was the problem. So, and they're really good, you know, FEMA with the failure on a Saturday, um, I submitted the paperwork on that Saturday to FEMA. They get to work Monday. Um, there's a bit of an issue with the paperwork. We get it fixed Wednesday. Customer had inverter Thursday. So it was actually really amazing and fast. If there wasn't an issue with the paperwork, like if I actually probably would have launched the paperwork on a Monday rather than trying to do it on the Sunday, the customer probably would have had the, the Tuesday or Wednesday would have the inverter in a remote area in Australia. So um, it's pretty amazing that customer service. So, um, and I see a lot of installers, I know a lot of installers do watch these videos and maybe think about giving FEMA a go because I know there's a lot of other companies out there that take months to get you paid, get your inverter and swap it over. And I think, uh, and that customer actually really wasn't happy with the experience that they had um, because yeah, the installer has stuffed up two inverters basically in my opinion, that's where I'm sticking at. <laughs> so, um, and yeah, the customer wasn't happy and like, it's amazing. Saturday product, Thursday after stuff up with the paperwork. So amazing service it asked me from FEMA so I'm, I'm all, all for FEMA so um cool yeah so that's the reason we use them because they're so much faster now what I want to show you a couple of other tricky things that you can do with AC coupling and why AC coupling is so powerful in an off-grid situation and I want to talk about these these catch relays so this is an Australian made product and what you can do with frequency shifting now you can actually buy this and have it installed anywhere in the world um 
I actually don't know if they run on 110 volts, but maybe double check. But anywhere in the world, you're 240, you can buy one of these from Australia and they'll ship it, ship it around. If you're in the States, you know, your, your money's a lot more valuable than ours, so these will be actually quite cheap. But this is what I use at my house to control my hot water. Now, these work on frequency. And so in that off-grid situation, we'll just go back and look at one of these. So when, as you can see this one here, it's starting to fill the batteries up and the frequencies are getting higher. So when they get to that point where, you know, this one here is actually probably not far off shift, shift in the frequency. Um, what can happen? So what happens when you're using the catch relay? Now it can turn loads on and off from a frequency point of view. And the good thing about it, it's on an app on the cloud and you can do it all time based. So like for me, the network changes their frequency of a day and they do it overnight. I don't want my hot water to heat overnight because I have 25 kilowatt of solar on the roof. I never ever want to heat my hot water at night. So I actually have the catch relay set up that it goes, okay, only of a day when the frequency shifts will heat the hot water. If the frequency shifts of a night, we're not going to turn on because Mike doesn't want to burn his batteries because if my hot water comes over night, even with the frequency shifts on, you know, instead of pulling from the grid, my system will burn my batteries overnight because my system's set up to minimize what I take from the grid. Something to think about there. So um, now in an off-grid situation, when the PV inverters just start to frequency shift and it's gone, hey, cool, we don't need all that excess power, you can actually turn your hot water on which will turn on a big load because the, the Victron's start to frequency shift and slow down because the batteries are getting full, where then we can turn a big load on from frequency. And the, the good thing about the catch relay, we can say, okay, well, let's turn it on. Let's have it on for a minimum of three hours or two hours or whatever, an hour to make sure that that fre frequency shift changes because once the load comes on, the Victron will turn back down the frequency and let the PV inverter throttle right up and go flat out. Then we'll heat our hot water once the hot water's hot and it's done and dusted, the Victron will go back to shift the frequency to make sure to turn everything back off and therefore the catch relay will turn back off, which is pretty amazing. Um, so that's something really cool you can actually do with these um, catch relays. The other really good thing about them now is, say for example, they actually they have cloud tethering. So if say for example, you know, you might've built a, you know, the, just the way hot water works, you know, off grid, we get a lot of sheds. We put this whole solar system on the shed in a paddock away from the house, and the hot water is over in the house. So, with these, you actually buy a cloud version. So, it's got a SIM card in it. Uh, you can get a Wi Fi version as well. So, you can actually connect the internet. You don't have to pay for the, um, the SIM card in it. But literally, you put it over in the house, and it'll work all on frequency. So, you don't have to have, you can have your off grid solar system out in the paddock. And you don't have to have your hot water near your, your shed and things like that. So it's really cool um, and what you can do with that there. So it's pretty exciting. So, yeah, there's lots of cool things. And this is my opinion, this catch relay. Uh, it's a, the best. If you're grid connected and you're thinking about going off grid, you want to put batteries and stuff like that on, I'd really consider what is the reason that you want to go off grid. Now, if your intention is to go off grid to save money, I would buy this because all a battery is, you're putting energy away to store for later on, that's that, that simple. So hot water is no different, you get all this excess solar, you put in 10 kilowatt hours or 15 kilowatt hours. Uh, I might actually look at the data, I've actually got a 400 liter hot water tank, I went the biggest hot water tank I could get, because what I wanna do is if we don't have sun for a few days and we don't need to heat the hot water with excess energy, we won't. So we can charge our batteries, keep everything alive and that sort of stuff, so uh, it's quite fun. So yeah, so if you were wanting to save money, I would say this is the best money spent to put a battery in. Uh, and the other thing as well, what's really good about these, I'll just talk about solar hot water. Uh, I think solar hot water is dead because it's too good. Um, it's one of those things that solar hot water have actually it's killed itself because in summer, when it's hot, solar hot water works way too efficient. And the problem is if you've got, you know, three square meters on your roof getting taken up by solar hot water panels, you know, you're only using that roof space for two, three hours of a day. You could throw that in the bin, put solar panels up, two or three solar panels, use a catch relay. And the good thing about a catch relay, you know, if you want to save some money, you can use just a typical electrical hot water system. I'd probably highly recommend that if you want to do from an energy efficiency point of view, is use a heat pump. Now, I didn't use a heat pump because I actually have, I'm on the grid and there's a lot of times where I have, way too much solar, 
I've got nothing to turn on. And if I feed back to the grid, they actually charge me for it. So I wanted a really big dump load that I can control that if the network's charging me to send energy back to the grid, I can turn my hot water on. So I actually didn't want to try and save energy in that situation. We're in an off-grid situation. You know, if someone said to me, Mike, call me up these days, hey, what am I going to do for hot water? I would highly recommend catch relay and heat pump. Simple. That's just hands down what you're doing because that extra, if you just go back to the solar hot water, we're putting panels up there. Once you've heated your solar hot water and your, and your hot water's hot, we're taking that roof space, that three square meters of roof space, and then we're going to put it into an EV or run loads in your house or other things we're going to do with it. We're instead in a solar hot water situation. It's done. It's off. You, you can't use that for anything else except for heating hot water. So that's and it's the same as solar powered air cons. Everyone's I need to get a solar powered air con. I'm with the opinion leave the panels because you've got to buy more panels for your solar air con. If you're not running the air con, you've got panels sitting on your roof going to waste. So I think about having all your panels in one system and having smarts that you can heat the hot water, charge your electric car. I'm getting more and more people asking me about electric cars and stuff off grid. So this is something to think about uh, in that situation there. So um, cool. So that's my opinion when it comes to solar hot water and off grid. And the, the really good thing about it is back to this AC coupling, what I suppose the whole, this whole video is about is we can, um, oh, everyone's dropped off. Uh, we can use that frequency when our batteries are full. We can use that frequency to divert the power and to, you know, and the catch relay can just turn loads on. So it could be an irrigation pump off grid. So you might go, okay, cool, Mike, when the frequency shifts. And that's why I love the Victron with this frequency shift because it's been used by the networks for so long and it just works. You know, it might be, okay, you know that your batteries are full by 11 o'clock. And you might say to the catch relay, well, don't come on the first time. You know, when you get to 52.5 hertz, maybe only start the hot water circuit. And then maybe later on, once the hot water circuit's done, we know that's done and it's gone through its cycle, hot water's hot. When you get to 53 hertz, let's turn on the irrigation pump for two hours and so you can turn on another load. So therefore you can pump water up to your header tank and store your water for later on. So it's a big believer of having everything in one system. And it's the same as gas. I'm not a big fan of gas. I never really have been. Um, with gas, it's more finance the way I think about it. With your gas cooking, gas hot water backup. I know people do it because of costs and things like that. I personally would rather have electric hot water. It's cheaper. And have your diesel generator as your backup to heat your hot water in those rainy, cloudy days and things like that. So and that's a more better option. And, you know, the, yeah, it takes a lot of diesel or running the diesel a lot to get your money back compared to like a solar hot water system and things like that. So, um yeah, something to think about, or gas, you know, the money you spend on gas over the time of years, like I said, it's just finance is how I think about it. So, um, cool. So guys, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna open up the question. I think I've pretty much finished everything. I'm just gonna double check up here. FEMA, we've talked about that. Uh, look, with the FEMA, if you do want the program settings, we'll leave a link in the description below. Uh, we do charge for it because it's, um, you know, a lot of installers like to use this stuff and information. So it's a commercial product for us, all the study and research we've done to give access to that. If you're a customer of ours, like you've bought an off-grid solar system over the years, it's completely free access to it. But if you're someone wanting to buy it on a commercial basis, um, the link will be in the description below and take you through the payment to get access to the documents for that there. Um, okay, cool. So the other thing I want to talk about, yeah. So um, if you want to view a couple of systems, so Andy from the off-grid garage, so he's done his whole system with no AC coupling at all. He's all DC coupled. Um, and the way he's done his system. And the reason I want to bring Andy up, he's got some really cool videos. If you're someone that wants to build your own batteries and get all the, that sort of stuff, that's what Andy does. But you can actually have a look at Andy's online. So if you go over to the off-grid garage, tell him Mike sent you, John put in his comments, so, hey, Mike from the off-grid shop sent us over here. Go check it out. Andy does some really good videos. He's up in Queensland and he punches some content out. He's, um, and it's some really good, interesting stuff. So if you really want to see this data and like understand it all, he does a lot of videos around it. You can actually see his system live, the off-grid garage, uh, and what it's monitoring. So anyone can actually have a look on, look on that. So go watch one of his videos. I'll have the link there. We'll put the link in our description as well below. Um, that one there. So there's also the off-grid shop. You can do the same thing and look at our system. Um, the link will be in the description below. So if you actually want to see what's going on um, in my place. And then one other thing I just want to show you. So um, my house is a bit complicated. Um, there is a video which we'll post up here 
I'll put the link in the description below about my house. I actually have two systems. So I actually have two batteries. You see my battery just, well, it was 30% before it's gone down. Um, what's going on? I'll show you how my system works. So I've got a solar edge system. Um, there's a lot of Amber Electric, I'll just quickly touch on this. A lot of people ask about smarts and things like that. <laughs> yeah. It's all very new at the moment. So I brought this system here and installed it for money making. So I'm on the grid. When the energy is cheap, we charge these batteries. When it's expensive, we dump back to the grid. So the blue is all self-sufficiency. Red is we're buying from the grid. And green is we're selling back to the grid. As you can see, I have like no load here of a night. Because what happens of a night is my house runs on the Victron. We'll come back to the next day. We'll do that. It's up here somewhere. Go to the next day. Pop it in the morning. See, so just after midnight, um, over eight kilowatt hours battery storage at the moment. My Victron, yep. I think, I, yep. Oh, I see, so it's six, a bit over six and a half kilowatt hours on the Victron. So the Victron goes flat, and then we jump over to the Solar Edge, and we run off the Solar Edge until the morning, and we start firing back there. So these little red bits here and there, just sort of miscalculations stuff from time and monitoring. Um, but that's how my system works. So I have two complete battery systems. That's another question we've been asked quite a lot is um, a lot of people say you can't have two different battery systems. And I think it comes down to a lot of installers just don't understand. That's how I do it. Um, and the monitoring is not good because if you look at mine right now, it thinks my house is pulling six kilowatts from the grid. On that one, we jump over to the Victron. Um, it says it's 7,000 watts loads. And it says we're taking nothing from the grid, you know. So from a Victron's point of view, um, and that the, the reason the Victron is taking nothing from the grid, because it can't see the hot water and it can't see my car charger. So the Victron, the way I've got it set up, will never ever heat from the hot water from the um, batteries. The Victron can't see that load. And the EV charger, so the Victron can't see the EV charger as well. So that's why they look different. The loads, as you can see, it thinks the house is on 13 kilowatts because it's more likely the um hot water system on there that's um punching that out so um cool so um yeah that's why it's different a lot of you guys don't do that i've tried with solar and leaks before solar and leaks is a really good monitoring platform it's just not really good for batteries and i've got way too many things going on to try and get a really good monitoring data for my system so uh it's a bit complicated so cool all right guys well um that one's there, off your garage, yep, us. So if you want to see any of the systems, this solar edge system is live as well. The link will be in the description below. You actually can see um, the solar edge system. You can see my data, you can stalk me. You can see when I'm buying energy from the grid. So oh, there we go, we're buying. So that's actually the hot water coming on and it's just not enough to service that load. So um, I'll quickly show you the whole time market right now and what's going on. So this is a free app. If you do have an EV charger, um, or you get an EV and you're grid connected. Um, ah, it's app, isn't it? App, charge, HQ, it's one we want to see. Let's go have a look. Um, always. Okay. So as you can see from the wholesale market right now, the feed-in tariff or usage is only five cents a kilowatt hour. So I'm on the wholesale market. So I play around by wholesale. So even right now, like most people paying about 30 to 40 cents a kilowatt hour, I'm not, I'm only paying five cents. So, and that frequency shift has come on and told my hot water to heat up and do its thing. Also my car's charging at the moment as well. So what would be happening here in my settings, um, I've actually probably got, um, can I do it from here? I'll just stop my car. It's on auto. It'll turn the car off and stop the car from charging. But what I think I've actually got in here is, um, if the rates are less than nine cents, charge the car because basically my wife, you know, basically she drives sometimes takes the car of a day and we can't charge of the day, so we need to charge it overnight. So we've got it set up that she's always got power in the morning, she needs to take the car and stuff like that. So um so we've got it set that if the if the prices of a night get cheap more than nine cents, and normally that happens, our batteries are normally gone flat, it's at three to seven in the morning sort of time, and it'll actually charge from that there. So um cool. So, um, all right, guys, I'll jump into some questions. So I think it's finished what I want to talk about. I hope I answered everyone's questions out there. So, um, Mr. Starman, the electricity company charge you for giving them more power. Yes, they do. So in Australia, and it, the, yeah, 
look, it's just more for human behavior because unfortunately that's how humans react is, um, you know, when we charge people to do things, it normally changes people's behavior. So what they do in Australia on the weekends, it's very common that when there's no one around using energy, they want to try and stop all the big solar farms and everyone sending all the energy back to the grid because they don't want it. Um, I'm actually trying to work with something at the moment on um, for low income earners that are in housing commission houses and things like that in Australia, that ideally, if we can get everyone to get a smart meter, and get everyone on the wholesale market, as you can see, the price has just changed, jumped up to seven cents. In Australia, every five minutes, the prices change. So it's a five minute market. And so what happens on that five minute market there is um, there are times of the day, yes, when it's in negatives. And if, if you don't have solar and you're using energy from the grid, you actually get paid to use energy from the grid. So what I'm trying to work out and um, is work with low income houses and get the government involved. And uh, there's a few different companies I'm talking to at the moment there. What we can do is put smart meters in everyone's houses and really help these people. And rather than try and put solar up and we just put smart meters up, we get everyone on the wholesale market. And when energy is really cheap, we just put a battery in everyone's houses. It's really going to help the network out. Um, like if someone said to me today, Mike, you're grid connected, would I put solar up or a battery? I'd say forget the solar, get on the wholesale market and just put a battery up because there is so many times during the week. I would say at least during the week, two or three times you could charge your battery for free. And most weekends between nine o'clock, 10 o'clock at the latest, through to about two, three o'clock in the afternoon, you can charge a battery, actually get paid to charge your battery um, during those times. So just, just think about it like the easiest way to understand when, um, when they're giving energy away for free is when you're at the beach on a really hot, good, sunny day and you're out enjoying yourself. That, that's when normally they give, they give it away for free because no one's using the energy and they want to encourage people to use it or lose it basically and stop everyone from feeding back to the grid when no one's around. And that's how they try and stabilize the grid to reduce what goes in, So, um, which is cool. So if anyone else has any more questions, just post in the comments down below. Uh, cool, Mr. Summer, thank you. Um, 50 hertz in the UK, um, awesome. So 50 hertz in the UK, I know the US is 60 hertz. Um, awesome, done. Cool, cool, cool. Um, yeah, was anyone else got any more questions out there? Anything else I can talk about that I haven't answered from an AC coupling point of view? Uh, I might actually just jump out of that video and just actually have a look at um, a couple of the questions on this one here. Think towards more micro inverters. Yeah, cool. So micro inverters. Yeah, micro inverters, same thing. You can frequency shift them. Um, Look, there's actually N phase have pretty much dominated and owned that market until Holy Miles has come around. Um, I think that's what they're called. Um, they've got a really good concept. I like what they're doing um, with their, their micro inverters. And honestly, after the Lismore floods, I was like, I'm only ever selling micro inverters moving forward because <laughs> uh, everyone lost their solar inverters in the floods because the, the literally the floods went everyone's gutters, so which is pretty crazy. Um, okay, cool. Um, thanks, Brad. The great job. Um, okay, solar's PV inverter. So yeah, so look, a lot of these cheaper inverters, um, and solar is a cheaper. Like and I'd say it's a cheap quality inverter. Um, they just they just work. There's a lot of them in Australia, and basically with those lot of cheaper inverters, you just need to check whether they can be controlled by frequency, and it's going to be like when they were made. Most most things in Australia, if it's like a five year old inverter would have that frequency shifting capability. Um, clever, I thought you used a PV inverter, battery inverter, very and clever indeed, thank you. Love that one. Um, most informative video question asked, please. Do all grid tight inverters work in the same way? Um, yeah, so that Zeva Solar, uh, I'm pretty sure it's Zeva Solar, they will work because Zeva Solar, I think if you look, open them up and go to SMA and Zeva Solar, if Simon watches this video, I'll get Simon to comment on that one there. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's Zeva Solar. They're actually an SMA. They're both a German company, really good quality inverters, and they I think they're made in the same factory, basically. So Zeva Solar is something that probably would work. Um, solar Edge inverters. Now, yeah, so with Solar Edge, it's a good good one. Um, I used to be a really big fan of Solar Edge. Um, look, I think they're a great product. If, yeah, they really compete that micro inverter shading and things like that. 
I think we are in Australia one of the first companies to do solar edge off grid. Uh, and I think we do have the document somewhere with it. We actually only did one um, because we basically stopped. Um, if anyone that doesn't know that we don't supply products anymore, we don't sell products. Uh, we only do consulting and advice and design work now uh, after the floods. So we don't supply any products anymore. Now, um, solar edge inverters do work off grid. We've got one. Um, yes, yeah, so it cranks. It's great. I love it. So it does a really good job. So um, it's good. Okay. Um, Grant says, oops, apologies. So um, why hasn't someone else developed a single unit? This is what you're suggesting. So, yeah, it's very interesting. I think it's more the cost um, where someone hasn't sort of created that. Well, technically, that's what an AC coupled inverter is, all the all-in-one inverters. And, you know, yeah, so um, in the States, if you watch the, the Will Prowse, he does a lot of stuff. Um, but, yeah, I think technically there is some of this stuff that's already done out there, all-in-one all unit. I just don't think you get the quality of what you can do putting it together yourself. Um, and also, like I said at the start, if you are DC coupled and AC coupled, and that's why I recommend like it, my number I try and work with is one thirty of solar panels to um, batteries and two thirds to the AC couple. And that's the other thing I was going to show is um, two different grant. Yep, two different brands. As long as yep, one shed, one house. I covered that. Uh, as long as they both can be controlled by frequency. Um, can you make a parallel between grid tie inverter and any standard off-grid inverter? Look, as long as the grid connected inverter, the off-grid inverter does have frequency shift. And like I said, the Selectronics won't. They do do frequency shifting, but it's more, the Victron's very like, they ramp, they can ramp things up and down and they can smoothly do it the way the Victron works. Where Selectronics is like on, off, on, off. So yeah, that's doable. Not with Selectronics very nicely. They do do it, but not nice. Um, yep, seven micro inverters. We've answered that one. Does it apply to most off grid systems, specific models and brands only? So, look, most most systems will have a frequency shifting, uh, but Victron's just one of those ones that just does it the best and it's something that they just own and they do, and it's great. So, um, cool. Uh, well, guys, I think I'm going to wrap it up. There's no more questions there because we're getting under the hour, we want to keep it under, under an hour. Thanks, part-time planning for the thumbs up. Really appreciate that. So, and cool. So, guys, thanks for watching. I hope this has been informative. And yeah, any comments or questions you want to know, like, post down below. Is there anything you feel I didn't cover? Um, yeah, whack a comment down below or just give me some feedback on that there. And if there's something else you want me to make a video on, uh, every Friday we're going to be doing these live streams and uh, we're going to be taking all the questions from YouTube from the week before and we're going to help answer everyone's questions live. And if you can't, if you can't be here live and you want a question answered, um eastern is basically a new marketing manager how do we do this there is somewhere on here on our channel on the off-grid shop uh oh we'll just click over here okay the off-grid shop website here we go um oh that's our useful links page as well so there's some links to some useful links um and on our website as well you can actually subscribe so you can actually come in here i don't know why it's not popping up but there's a link in there. You can come put your details in and subscribe and just send us an email uh, or just write the message on YouTube. It doesn't really matter where. Someone will check it. If you put the message on YouTube and let us know about it, we will um, we will check it out and we will collate it up and just, yeah, you can watch the video another time. So cool. Guys, thank you. Um, I really appreciate your support and everything over the years. And uh, I really hope this information has been helpful. And yeah, there's two things in my life that I think are the most, two most important things you can give anyone is your time and your attention. And I do really thank you for giving me your time and attention. Till next time, guys, have a great day.